mouth. Then they look in the trouble. Ran right up in the knowledge. Now they pack in the hollow. Now they know where to fight. I'm taking it every week. Me and your she mine. He won't bring you the heat. Now they know that we hit. And they know we quit. Yo, she might be jaded. Quick won't we'll bring you the game. Give me the unity. Cause they know we ain't stopping. And they know they got problems. And they ran out of houses. Well, we know we got a problem. Can't let it go unsolved. Rain race learn the Afro century history. We seen them all. Uh, karma is karma. I say what I say, I hear the wall. Uh, till I see I fall off, then I bring y'all up on all I back up on my time winners, 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 the fire winners, time winners, fly winners, fly winners, I'm with you, fly with you. What up, though? 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 What up, though, family? What's up, Karen? Oh, Karen Vinzen, Yoshimat, the genius. What up, though? Sean Ace, JP. Oh, no, 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 no. Everybody here. Thank you. That, uh, introdu that introduction is by Yoshimat, the genius. I hope you guys will join us this uh, Sunday when we do our regular program then and now. Check it out. Check it out. We go back and we reminisce, you know. But again, how you doing, Gabriel? Today, I, I want to talk about something. A lot of people keep asking me, Dr. Winters, where did the white man come from? 
you know, the black Muslims say he was created in a test tube. Other people say that he came from, in a sense, uh, that he that he descended from, uh, you know, uh, albinos. So all type of theories, all type of theories. But as you know, family, I try to check with the historical sources. How you doing, Anthony? Corzo Hotor, how you doing? I try to check with the sources. I do not like to bring you anything that I cannot defend. I don't want to teach you any bullish. Therefore, I want to talk about this issue, you know, because see, a lot of times over the years, you know, they're always talking about doing research on us. They're always telling us who we are, what we did, where we came from, or where they think that we came from. Then in uh, some circles, they even say they don't know where the, uh, where the black man came from, the so-called, quote, unquote, the Negro. But the thing is, this is that. The real mystery is not where we came from, because we know where we came from. We came from Africa. But what we do want to know is where did the Caucasians come from? These are very unique people. They are very unique people. You see, when you understand, when you, when you, after I get through talking to you about where, you, where the Caucasians came from, then you're going to get a better understanding of why, why they do the things they do. You know, a good example of that is that, uh, you know, is that I live in America. Um, you know, as a foundation of Black American, we're the uh, foundation of this country. We're the uh, the aboriginals of this country. And, and because we're the aboriginals, you know, people are always trying to steal our history or trying to uh, say that we don't have a history. How are you doing, Darlene X? But we do have a history. We have a great history. And so what I want to do is that this is a settler colony. We know the things that they've said they've done. We know how the... Uh, when the Spanish came over down in South America, they poisoned people, used a lot of, uh, you know, in North America, uh, the British, they specialized in giving our ancestors uh, blankets with smallpox. And now today we see over there in the Middle East where, where these uh, Europeans who, are, who have settled, who have settled uh, Israel are, are, are just, you know, killing people left and right. They don't, have any, they don't have any concern about the children. They don't have any concern about the women. They don't have any concern about the fact. I, I think they said that uh, that about two pregnant women are killed every day. Think about that. Two pregnant women killed every day. But this is nothing new because uh, back in the day when they took over California, uh, the one, of the one of the ways that they got rid of the black people, the aboriginals in California, was that they would pay they would pay money for scout for uh, scouts scouts. And this uh, this led to a lot of oh Melvin Mel, 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 Melvin Reed. Melvin Reed is here. Everybody, 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 bow down, bow down. This is my man, Melvin Reed. When Melvin Reed is here, I know everything's gonna be all right. Melvin, what up, though? Also, uh, Jay Lynn. But again, you know they uh they they use scalps and they used to scalp us, and uh, they would pay money for the scalps. But in California, what they did is this. They paid five dollars. I think it was five dollars for the scalp of a female, black female Indian. Three dollars for a child, and they only paid two dollars for an adult male, adult male scalp. Because see, their aim was not so much to kill the men, because the men didn't matter. They wanted to kill the women. They wanted to kill the children. You see, and so then what I want to do is you'll understand this when I explain to you where Europeans came from. So uh, let's let's get started. That way we might have time for some questions later. Okay. The white man came from where? Okay, uh, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, we see all of these caves. You see on the uh, right-hand side, I have all these pictures of caves. Yes, caves, caves, caves. And up under that, uh, that, that where the uh, sister and brother have that question mark, I'm showing you some of the pictures of the people who lived in these caves. Very important to understand, because if you want to know where the white man came from, you have to really study archaeology. You have to study anthropology. And you have to understand what happened, what happened in this world 10,000 years ago. You can go to my Patreon to, to uh, see the slides. Please join my Patreon. It's my Patreon members that allow me to do this. I mean, I had to uh, go and get several articles that I had to download you know, from the internet. And, and these articles are behind paywalls. 
It may cost as much as $39 to $100 to bring these articles down so I can read them. And the only way that I can do this is because of the, the grand, the wonderful support that uh, my patrons, my Patreon, you know, provide me with because it's their support. Please join my Patreon. The slides for this presentation will be in my Patreon. You can go to Twitter. You'll find me at Dr. Clyde Winters 8. And uh, you can also follow me at TikTok.com at Clyde Winters 3. Also, you go to uh, TikTok. They got, you know, they, uh, my uh, shorts on, on uh, TikTok have thousands, hundreds of thousands of views. Go and check them out. Find out about some of that information. And I want to thank, I want to thank, um, you know, um, all the people who, who've posted because a lot of people have posted my uh, videos on on TikTok even before me. You know, I have an, uh, I have a channel on TikTok now, which is Clyde Winters Three. Go there and subscribe, man. You know that'll be good. I don't have, have a lot of subscribers, but there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of views for my videos, my short videos on TikTok. Uh, you can also view some of my shorts on YouTube. Right now, you're on my YouTube channel. This is where I've uh, been putting, uh, I've been posting uh, YouTube uh, videos, I think, since at least about 2008, 2010. So I've been, uh, I've got all type of videos here on this uh, channel, almost 300 videos that deal with every aspect of Black history, you see. I'm not new to YouTube. I'm not new to YouTube. You know, I just started doing lives, but I'm not new to YouTube. So I just, I just saw YouTube as a vehicle to make the family aware of our history, give our, give the family a place where they could go and find material so that they could, you know, debate and they could uphold this, uh, this beautiful uh, history that we have. And you can order my books at Amazon.com. Again, join my Patreon to see the slides. Uh, this, uh, this particular uh, lecture discussion is going to uh, deal with two books that I've written. One of the books is Origin of the Black Neanderthals and the White Race. And uh, my other book is Blacks in Europe, Prehistory to Contemporary Times. If you want to find out more about where the white man came from, you want to find the details, and you want to have, have easy access to the sources, get these two books, Origin of Black Neanderthals and the White Race, and Blacks in Europe, Prehistory to Contemporary Times. You know, these books will help you to get a further understanding of, you know, where the uh, Caucasian or the white man came from. What is FBA? FBA is not a group. FBA is not an organization. FBA is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry, or pedigree. As a result, we are descendants of the African and Aboriginal Blacks who built the United States. B1 is acknowledging your Black African ancestry and mod, not heritage. We must be race men and women proud of our culture and African Black ancestry. This is very important. You know, I always hear, you know, a lot of my uh, Aboriginal brothers, they uh, talk about the fact in the sense that, that, that uh, they talk about the fact in the sense that, that we, that we shouldn't in a sense be able to, to, uh, to know what's going on. And this is kind of sad. And it's really sad. It's really sad because the fact is that, you know, it's, it's sad because what people don't understand is that we do need to know this, you know, we do need to know this stuff. And in fact, we also need to understand that by looking at these materials, we can find out more, you know, we can find out more information, you know, and this is, this is the thing that, that, that hurts a lot of us. What hurts a lot of us is that we don't really get a chance to understand that you have to be B1. A lot of my, uh, a lot of my Aboriginal brothers, they're always saying, I'm not black. I'm not black. You know, I'm Aboriginal and uh, sure you are Aboriginal, but the point is this is that how do you think I was able to find out that your ancestors were black? The only way that I could find out that your ancestors were black was based upon the fact that when the Europeans saw these, uh, these Aboriginals, they said they're black. They have, uh, they have thick noses. Thick lips. They they're black in complexion. This is how I can know. So so when, when my Aboriginal brothers say that that they're not black, and when they say that that they're Aboriginal, they're just they're just fooling themselves. Aboriginals were black. The only way I could tell our Aboriginal heritage was I had to, in a sense, 
find in these books where they describe the people as being black. That's why you are black. Stop it. Stop lying to yourself. You see, our group self-interest is B1. Yes, being black first. We had to be black first. The white man came from where? Again, as I said, here you can see some of the caves uh, from which the uh, white the white people exited the caves, and you can see some of the uh, cave uh, some of the uh, images of the uh, whites who lived in the caves for over ten thousand years. Yes, these whites lived in the caves for ten thousand years. One thing that people have a mistaken idea about is they wonder about this whole idea about mankind and pigmentation. You see, many people don't understand that that black people. Black people, they carry the genes that produce pale skin, you see? Yes, they produce the genes that can produce pale skin. And that results from the fact that pale skin is nothing more in a sense than, than another aspect of being black. We have been taught a lie. We have been taught a lie that Neanderthals look like, look like other, other uh, look like whites. You see that picture on the left-hand side? I put an X across it. I put X across because that's not how Neanderthal really looked. That's not how Neanderthal really looked. But see, when Europeans discovered the Neanderthal skeletons, because of the broad Negro features, they declared they were a primitive, ugly people. Over time, they began to depict Neanderthals as pale-skinned European looking to try and make it appear that contemporary Europeans are native to Europe. This is a lie. Until after 1700 BC, the only Europeans were Negroes. Whites came from Central Asia. Look at that uh, picture on the uh, below, below, and you can see how a depiction of a reconstruction of an authentic Neanderthal. When you look at this Neanderthal, the only difference between this Neanderthal and other blacks, West Asteroid black, Tasmanoid or Tasmanian black, uh, the first British, the you know, the first British black and the Romanian black. The only difference is, is that Neanderthal had a, a, a broad bridge across his forehead. You see that bridge over his eyes where the bridge came a little forward and it overlapped his eyes? That's the only difference between a Neanderthal and the rest of us as black people. That was the difference. But the European wanted to sell you a bill of goods. They wanted to make you feel that that picture up at the top on the uh, left-hand side, that that's how Neanderthal man looked. He didn't look like that. No, he didn't look like that. We carry two, we, the, the genes in a sense that produce the various, the various color and eye color, eye color, skin color. They include HERC2 and OCA2. You know, these, these genes are associated with light skin, eyes, and hair in Europeans. But see, they arose, they arose in Africa and it's found among sand people. Yes, yes, yes. The Khoi sand people, they carry all of these traits. All of us carry these traits in, in reality. But uh, but when the uh, Khoisan, when they migrated into Europe, they took these genes with them. And that's how Europeans, in a sense, were able to get this uh, the light skin. But see, uh, light skin, that's one of the reasons why we have light-skinned children, dark-skinned children, is because of the fact that we carry all the genes to predict the various skin color and eye color. You know, blue eyes, dark skin, you know, they, they always talk about the, one of the earliest uh, Europeans is Lebrana Man. And when they talk about LeBron and man, they bring up the fact that blue eyes, that they have blue eyes, but look, look, we we have blue, some of us have blue eyes too. That's because the fact in the sense is that we carry those genes, see? But they want you to believe that you're if you have light skin, if you have uh, gray eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, they want you to believe that that you got these eyes not from a natural existence as a black person, they want you to believe that somewhere along the line, some, some white person, some Caucasian, raped your mama, your grandmama, somebody, and because they raped your grandmama, then that's how you had a blue eyes, a gray eyes. No, 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 no. We already carry the genes for that. There's already black people with blue eyes. You know, black people carry the genes to make pale skin. Yes, you know, the two genes, the genes to make pale skin is SLC24A5 and SLC45A2, you see? And that these genes lead to deep these genes lead to pigmentation. And it also explains how when white, when black people went into the caves, we became dig depigmented, you see. And that's how, in a sense, we see pale skin 
among Europeans, you see. But as you can see, he can see brothers with, he can see some brothers with blonde hair, another brother with straight hair, kinky hair. These are all genes that we already carry. There's an, and then you see at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the slide, a sister with her albino baby. We carry all these genes, you see. So it's very important to understand that just because somebody has straight hair, curly hair, you know, so-called so-called uh, uh, European features, those aren't European features. They got them from us. See, because we were the first man, we were the first woman. Therefore, any any way that Europeans look has to come from you. But I wanted to tell you where these genes came from that, that gave us the ability to produce pale skin. It's very important. Let's continue. You see, Neanderthals, they spread with homo, homo sapiens. You never see them on that Mr. Charge because there was no difference. Yes, yes. They always go through this process of saying, ah, oh, where, where, where is he? Where is he? The, the, the Neanderthal. Oh, all the Europeans got Neanderthal. That's a lie. That's a lie. They just made this, they just made this issue up to make you think that Neanderthal man is different from anybody else. But Neanderthal men were Negroes just like Cro Magnum man. Look at that, those pictures. We see Neanderthal man. And then when you go across, you see the Cro Magnum. Yes, this is Cro Magnum. I know when you read a lot of archaeological books, they sh they show you a picture of some white, some some white person with blonde hair and say, oh, these are the Cro Magnum. No, no. The Cro Magnums were those people in that picture that are on the right side. As a result, when they discovered Neanderthal remains in 1829. They were shocked to discover that these people were Negroes, just like the Africans. They were enslaved in the Americas. You had to understand, this scared the hell out of them. Because, see, in their mind, they wanted to always believe, in a sense, that, that Caucasians had always ruled Europe. They didn't, want, they didn't want, in a sense, believe that any other people had been the, been the superior, the superior race of Europe. But when they found those skeletons of Neanderthals and skeletons of the Picts, and then skeletons of the uh, of the uh, early Irish, you know, they start saying, "Damn, all these people were black. What the hell is this?" So, 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 so. But they thought they were safe, although they kept finding all these skeletons of black people because of the fact that it was against the law for us to be able to read back in the uh, 19th century because we were slaves. They felt they could hide this information from us. But today we can go back and look at those books. And we can, we can recover that part of our history. Neanderthals were not white. Caucasians had to change the image of the caveman ne Neanderthal because of the black power history teacher and Afrocentrism. Let me explain to you. As researchers began to, to do excavations in Europe, in, in, in the Middle East, they began, every time they would dig deep and they would find a group of people in Samaria, ancient Egypt, the skeletal remains would always show Negroes. Always show black people, just like you, just like me, just like us. So then they had to change the image of the uh, of of how Neanderthal man looked. Although ne although Neanderthal man looked like the uh, the picture on the uh, on the right hand side, they started trying to give them pale skin. They started trying to give them long uh, long uh, hair, you know, because they wanted to try to invent a history. See, see the Caucasian. He doesn't have a history. He doesn't have an ancient history. And you're going to understand why he doesn't have an ancient history as I discuss the origin of Caucasian people. There's a wonderful book called The Iceman's Inheritance. This book is by Michael Bradley. Let's look at the full title of his book is The Iceman's Inheritance, Prehistoric Sources of Western Man's Racism, Sexism, and Aggression. Very important book. You know, this wonderful book by Michael Bradley dwells into the anthropological reasons why white European people have perpetuated violence, pollution, destruction, and genocide wherever they have historically traveled around the world. Isn't, isn't that what we're seeing over there in the Middle East? Right now we see these people, these people from Europe, they moved in Israel and they're trying to destroy those people, those Palestinians. Michael Bradley dwells into the Neanderthal genes present in the modern white European populace as a source for their psychosexual insanity and aversion to societies based in peace and justice. Uh, if you want to read more about 
his interpretation of why Europeans do the, do the things they do. Get Michael Bradley's book, The Iceman's Inheritance. Bradley argues that racism, sexism, religion, patriarchy, colorism, you know, colonization, history, all that and other social problems are the result of the behavior, values, and psychology of the white race or Caucasians. According to Bradley, this results from the fact that they have an inferiority complex, which makes them feel they have to dominate other races to feel secure. This inferiority complex comes from the fact that they know they are a minority race in comparison to other races in the world, and they like a true ancient history. Yes, yes, this is what Michael Bradley recognized, but I'm the one talking about the fact that they lack a true ancient history. Michael Bradley in 1979 published the Iceman's Inheritance. Bradley, a native of Canada, shocked the world when he wrote this book. In the Iceman's Inheritance, Bradley argues how these things occur. Right now, you know, you can get a free copy of the Iceman's Inheritance. It's on the web. If you want to get this free copy, you know, on the web, just put in there Iceman's Inheritance PDF. You can find this free copy of Iceman's Inheritance at https colon slash slash archive, A-R-C-H-I-V-E dot org, O-R-G slash details, D-E-T-A-I-L-S slash the Iceman's Inheritance. You know, check that out. I'll let this uh, remain a little while so you can copy it down. So you can go and read this uh, valuable book and see uh, Michael Bradley's argument on uh, why uh, why uh, Caucasians do the, the devilish and evil things they do. Okay. Bradley claims that these maladaptive behaviors of Caucasians came from the former existence of Neanderthals in Ice Age Europe. Bradley argues that Caucasoid aggression is the result of evolutionary and cultural experiences. It is therefore a product of social epigenetics, which allowed Caucasians to use their environment and cultural experience to select aggression to preserve their existence through white supremacy. Yes, white supremacy is based upon this whole idea that for, for Caucasians to survive, they had to keep every race down because they are a minority. They are, they're, they're a minority. And, and we know many studies uh, show today that many Caucasians are dying out. Bradley believes that the Neanderthals were Caucasians, but the Neanderthal people were black, as I already showed you, and had a peaceful hunter-gatherer society where they had access to abundant resources from the local flora and fauna to accommodate their dietary needs. The art of Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon man makes it clear that this culture was a matriarchal society, as evident in the abundance of female figurines denoting their emphasis on fertility and reproduction. Yes, yes. So so why would these people, if they were so mean and evil, this Neanderthal, why would they make such beautiful art? See, why would they see the women? Why would they see the woman as such a superior? As I, as I tell you guys, just about every week, the European Caucasians know that, that our true, our true, pathway to really being, in a sense, close to God, Amma. Our pathway to being close to God comes from our association with our women, because it's our women who have that intimate relationship with Amma that allows us, in a sense, to be able to be all that we can be. And that's why the European spends all his time trying to separate the Black man from the Black woman, because by separating the Black man from the Black woman, they're trying to break that connection between us and God, because it's that black woman who gives us that love, who gives us that support, who gives us, in a sense, that knowledge and wisdom. Yes, knowledge and wisdom. See, I, I can't I can't tell you how many times I fucked up when I didn't want to listen to my wife. Whoa, whoa. My baby doll tried to tell me intelligent things to do, but I wanted to have it my way because my father said, the man run everything. And we do. But we run everything because our women allow us to think we're running everything. See, and the Caucasian wants to break that connection. He doesn't want you to be close to your woman. He doesn't want you to be able to have that power. If the, ne if the Neanderthal and the Cro-Magnon people belong to a matriarchal society, we have to ask the question, 
Where did the Caucasians acquire their aggressive, predatory, and xenophobic character? The answer is that the Caucasians learned these behaviors when they were locked in the caves for thousands of years after the onset of the Younger Dryas, down to the Santorino volcano corruption. The Younger Dryas began around 12,000 years ago. Back in those days, in a sense, you know, uh, you know, people in a sense lived in the, you know, had many caves. Sometimes they used the caves as houses. And uh, they, they found that the caves, in a sense, was a, was a good place to live, you know, because of the fact that it was a, a easy and accessible. And they would, uh, they would, in a sense, go in there, have fires, build compartments, and things like that, you know. The caves of Europe were seen as temples by the ancient blacks of Europe. Here they congregated and used them like temples. In the caves, these blacks record their history and worship their gods. Yes, yes. These were basically the uh, Anu people. And, uh, you know, in Khoisan. But these people, in a sense, they used to use the caves as, as religious places. They used to use these caves as temples. But see, what happened is, is that that suddenly began in the last ice age. The black man involved into whites during the last ice age. I explained in Blacks in Europe, modern Europeans originated in Central Asia. Yes, they originated in Central Asia. They de-evolved from Cro-Magnum Blacks into Caucasians after being trapped in the caves of Europe from the Younger Dryas, 12,900 to 11,700 years before the present, down to the Santorini volcanoes, you see? And so then what happened is, is that, you know, that, that last ice age came suddenly during the Younger Dryas. It came so suddenly that they found mastodons. Yes, mastodons. They found these mastodons with, with curd inside of their mouth. They, they found these mastodons, and it shows that they were they were chewing, uh, you know, vegetable vegetable matter like like grass and all that stuff at the moment that they were frozen. So that shows, in a sense, that that last a ice age became so became so, in a sense, quickly that people tried to run into the caves, and they ran into the caves because they felt that the caves would be sanctuary. They felt that if they ran into the caves, they would be protected from this terrible cold and snow that was uh, beginning, in a sense, to envelop them during the uh, onset of the last ice age. During the Younger Dryas, there was a sudden drop in temperature. Archaeologists have found frozen carcasses of mammoths with preserved stomach contents. These stomach contents led some archeologists to assume that this ice age appeared suddenly because they found some of the animals in a standing position, a position that suggested a sudden extinction of the mammoths. Yes, yes, yes. They found them standing. Can you imagine, you see, that, that the reason that these mammoths were in a standing position was because of the fact that that, that that cold came so quick, you know, brothers and sisters, they said, damn, we got to find some shelter. So they ran into the caves. The first Europeans were definitely black when they entered the Caucasians. Here's a, here's a, here's a reconstruction of how they said Cro-Magnum man looked, you know, and Cro-Magnum man, based upon the Khoisan and later the Anu, that these were the first people who settled Europe around 44,000 BC. So we know that those people who ran into the caves during the Younger Dryas period, they were black. The black Europeans evolved into, Caucas into Caucasians during the Ice Age. You see, I explained this in Blacks in Europe, so check it out. The caves of Europe were seen as temples by the ancient Blacks of Europe. Here they congregated and used them like temples. In the caves, these Blacks recorded their history and worshiped their gods. Since the last Ice Age in Europe came suddenly, the Blacks the blacks probably saw a sanctuary from the coal in their cave temples. Since the last ice age came suddenly, the blacks were trapped in the caves. The first Europeans were definitely black when they entered the caves. These are some reconstructions on the right-hand side. We see reconstructions of the various ancient Europeans. And as you can see, they were a Negroid. In the caves, due to the absence of sunlight, the Cro Magnum man, yes, these people, because they were in the caves and there was no there was no sunlight, the melanin left the skin. And instead of, in a sense, 
giving them a skin pigmentation, the, the melanin congregated in the hair, and they gave them different hair. If you notice in, in many uh in many Caucasian families, you know, you'll find that some of the many of the children can have different colored hair, some blonde, some br brunette, uh, some black. But again, we see this variety of colors, you know, in terms of hair, whereas among among black people, we see a, a variety of colors among the various children. You know, you can have light children, dark children, in between children, you know. But see, in, in, in relation to those blacks who ran into the caves, they became depigmented and their melanin stopped going into the skin because there was no sunlight and instead it went into the hair. In the caves, due to the absence of sunlight, the Argonassians lost the melanin in their skin. The melanin left the skin and congregated in the hair. This is evident when we look at depigmented creatures who live in caves. This is a this is a, 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 a cave dwelling, uh, uh, you know, an, animal. And as you can see, they're very pale. They're very pale. And so, so we know in a sense that as these black people stayed in the caves for thousands of years, they also became pale. You know, there's the uh, the evidence, the best evidence for these uh, for these the black people who turned into Caucasians come from the Lamarche Lamarche cave. The cave at Lamarche, France, was discovered by Leon Pericard and Stan Le Wolf in 1937. These researchers found 1,500 slate pieces with paintings carved upon them. These paintings or engravings in Lamarche include figurines of animals and humans. The most significant carvings of humans, humans. researchers have found over 155 human portraits that are over 10,000 years old. Did you hear that? 10,000 years old. These human portraits were made during the last ice age. Uh, if you look on the left, you can see one of these, uh, one of these, you know, portraits of uh, of one of the inhabitants of the caves. You know, this is evident when we look at the depigmented creatures who lived in the caves. As I said, they found over 155, over 155 different representations of the people who lived in the caves. These drawings from the Grotte, the Grotte, Grotte de Marche shows that various facial changes took place among the proto -Europe, the Proto-Caucasians who remained trapped in the caves until around 1400 to 1200 BC. So you can look over there on the right hand side and you can see these are all engravings from the caves. This is showing you some of the people who lived in these caves, you see. You know, where, whereas, the, whereas the black Muslims, they talk about the fact that, that the white man was invented you know, in a test too. They also talk about the fact, in a sense, other people talk about the fact that the white man, in a sense, are Caucasians. They came from being turned into albinos. But we can see, we can see in a sense that that the Caucasian people, we can see this transformation of Cro-Magnon man, the, the, trans, the, trans, the transformation of, of Cro-Magnon man who was black into these various European type creatures. Look at these, this is a picture. See, I'm bringing receipts. This is found at the Grotte de Marche. See, as you can see in the caves, the people lost their negroid features and became more serpent-like. Okay, if you can look at the picture before this uh, this comment, as you can see, we have a picture of a serpent, and then as you can see, we see that we see one of those we see the features of cro magnum man began to become more serpentine, more serpent-like, you see. On the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, I, again, I, I show you some of the uh, pictures of the people who lived in the caves 26, 35, 34,000 years ago. And you can see how these, these Europeans look totally different from those Europeans after they stayed in the caves for 10,000 years. Just compare, you can compare the pictures. The pictures on the top are reconstructions of how the people at that time looked in ancient Europe. And the pictures on the bottom, on the right-hand side, show you how these Black people who, who lived in Europe, represented by the reconstructed figures on the top, on the right side of the slide, they look totally different. And we see how, in a sense, that European went into a serpentine, more serpentine look. La Marche is a cave and archaeological site located in Le Sac-la-Chateau. 
a commune in the, in the department of Vienne, Western France. It is an archeological site that has an engineered much debate that has not been resolved to date. The carved etchings discovered there in 1937 show detailed depictions of humans and animals that are over 10,000 years old. This is a kind of a picture of the cave. The cave, the cave was very extensive. You got to understand in a sense that that this cave, the cave network, <laughs> you wouldn't imagine the cave network that exists before, I mean, below the surface in Europe. These caves are vast. These caves are very expansive, you see. And they found in these caves, in a sense, various materials that show how the people, how, how the ancient Caucasians lived in these caves. You see? Here's a uh, depiction of, uh, of, of probably how some of them look. Uh, as you can see, we can see some of the various, uh, if you look very closely and carefully, you can see many of these people living in the caves. They were probably hairy. You can see some of the faces that resemble those faces that we find in those depictions of the people from Grato, Grate, Le Marche. And so, and again, in a sense, so we can see how this is probably a good representation of how those people lived back then in the caves. But see, you have to understand that, as I told you, this network of caves is very extensive under Europe. Caucasians, while living in the caves, created a massive network of underground tunnels. Crisscrossing Europe, listen to me, these tunnels crisscross Europe from Scotland to Turkey. Did you hear what I said? These tunnels, they go all the way from Scotland and the UK all the way to Turkey. In Anatolia, a new book on the ancient superhighways has claimed, you know, German archaeologists said evidence of the tunnels has been found near hundreds of Neolithic set settlements all over the continent. Seemingly never-ending series of underground tunnels are confirmed to be man-made, and the architecture boggles even the most sophisticated designers. Yes, yes. These ancient Caucasians, when they lived underground in the caves, they made extensive paths. They was trying to get out. They were trying to find a way to get out. They wanted to get up to the surface, but they couldn't get out. They were stuck in the ground because after the ice age, it closed up all the exits and entrances to the caves. A German archaeologist, Dr. <coughs> Heinrich Kusch, said evidence of the tunnels has been found under hundreds of Neolithic settlements <coughs> all over the continent. In his book, Secrets of the Underground Door to an Ancient World, if you, want to, if you want to find out more about these caves, again, this book is by Dr. Heinrich Kusch, and it's called Secrets of the Underground Door to the Ancient World. The German title is Torre zur Utwelt. He says the fact that so many have survived after 12,000 years shows that the original tunnel network must have been enormous. Do you understand this? Think about that. These Caucasians who was living in the caves built a network of tunnels stretching all the way from Scotland all the way to Turkey and Anatolia. And these caves are extensive. Yes, this is where they lived. These cave paintings record the change in the proto-Caucasian physical form <coughs> into more human-like forms today. The pictures make it clear that the long chins and noses were a major feature of the proto-Europeans. You know, check out information on the Glade de Marche at http colon slash slash pascal dot dot perso dot neuf dot fr slash la gratte de la marche dot htm. You know, uh, and you can see that this chin is uh, is, is somewhat represented today. It's called the Hasberg. The Hasberg. Look over there on the uh, left hand side. You can see this fellow. He, he has what's called an Hasberg chin. So you can see how you can see how this these features that that develop that developed in a sense in the caves. They are there continue to be, and so you can also understand that when these people came out. When these people came out of the caves, they were mainly, they were very frightening looking. They didn't look too human. And that's one of the reasons why, even up to this day, even up to this day, if you notice, 
Caucasians are always trying to marry, you know, non-Caucasian women, you know, especially melanated black women, but they'll go for Asians, anybody, but they especially uh, gravitate towards melanated black women because it's, it's by marrying black women, I think, that they feel that they're going to be able to maintain their human appearance instead of the beastly appearance that many of them had in the caves. In my book, Blacks in Europe, pages 138 to 145, I talk about the first Caucasians and how they lived in the caves for thousands of years. During this time, they probably treated each other badly. Think about that. If you're living in a cave, you see, there was a lack of food resources in the caves. These birds, and so what do you think these, uh, these Caucasians, what do you think they ate if they lived in the caves? I'll give you a minute to think about it. There's no insects, there's no animals, there's no, uh, the, uh, they had little crawfishes and a, a few insects and stuff. But there was no real, there was nothing real to eat in the caves. Yes, you've guessed it, they ate each other. They ate each other in the caves because the only source of food would have been each other. See, if they were eating each other, can't that explain why they're so xenophobic? Why they really they don't really like to be around other people? Why they like to be alone? See, it helps you to understand in a sense. So when Michael Bradley, when he's talking about the aggression that occurred that he that he felt occurred in the caves during in a sense with Neanderthal man. It didn't occur with Neanderthal man. White people got that. Uh, Caucasians got that aggression. They got they got that 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 evil when they in a sense became when they devolved from black people into Caucasians after the younger Dryas from eating each other, being mean to each other. You see, what was life like in the caves of Europe? I discuss this in my other book. The Origin of Black Neanderthals and the White Race. Get that book and my book on the Prius of Europe. We can assume that when Caucasians lived in the caves, they early recognized that they should organize themselves into clans or tribes. The tribe would have protected its members from being preyed upon. The Caucasian living in the cave early re realized that other humans could provide them with valuable resources. Other humans could provide them with food, clothing, and weapons, you see? So, okay, let's say that you, you captured another human. If your tribe attacked another tribe of people, you know, then therefore, in a sense, once you, once you uh, killed those people, you got three things from those people. You got food, you see? You got their bones, and their bones, their bones could be, be made into tools, you see? You could also you could also get a uh, you could also in a sense get an, uh, an uh, you could also get something that that you could cook your food in or something that you could drink water from or you could in a sense eat food from and that would be the skulls right see so so to these early Caucasians living in the caves they found that the body in a sense was was very important and that the body could serve many purposes especially purposes in terms of keeping people alive. And then not only that, but if you skin, if you skin the members of the other tribe, you could also, in a sense, make clothing. You could have a coat, you could have a blanket, you could have all type of things. Because see, as you can see, the early Caucasians in the caves, they saw the body as being as being utilitarian. They never see, think about it. If they lived in the cave, they never associated the body as being part of them. Because they saw the body as a source of food. The body as a source of weapons, the body as a source of, 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 of utensils that they could use to cook, to eat, and things like that, you see? Because they had to eat each other if they wanted to have the food resources to survive, you see? Now you can see why they had those long chins, because they had those long chins, so when they were eating, that, eating those, uh, those dead bodies, they would make sure in a sense that it wouldn't cause disease when they would eat them up. The human body provided the, the cucosoids with clothing made of human skin. The human bone would have provided the materials to make tools and weapons such as knives and short spears. The bones could also be fashioned as protective armor by using 
human skin to bind bundles of bones together. Living in the caves during this time was a place of terror. It was terror because you could not trust any human you came in contact with. Due to the fear, this, ind fear, this individual might murder you. As a result, xenophobia became the principal attitude of Caucasians. Caucasian xenophobia became a protective measure that guaranteed that these in-groups, due to hatred and fear of the strangers, would be able to defeat and conquer the out-group because they represented anything that was foreign or strange. Very important, you see. Very important. You can't underestimate, never underestimate the impact of your genesis, the impact of your origin, you see, you see, because your origin will always play a role in terms of how you see yourself even in the future or at a different period in time. The Caucasian xenophobia nurtured in the caves became an epigenetic feature of the white man. This psychological outlook, which manifested within Caucasians, was taken with the Caucasian when they exited the caves, as demonstrated by the aggressive tendencies of the white man. In addition, because the human body was seen as a natural resource, Caucasians have developed the attitude that humans are, are a utility. Yes, they see you as a utility. They don't see you in a sense as something that should be loved, held, caressed. They see you in a sense, they see the body as something that you can use, you see, in any manner that you wish. Get my book, Origins of Black Neanderthals and the White Race. Learn more. How did the Caucasians, how did the Caucasians uh, lead a case? I know I already told you that uh, because of the fact that, that, that many of the exits and entrances to the caves were closed off because of the ice, the ice, in a sense, uh, over the thousand year period, many of their temples disintegrated, you know, the rocks and everything uh, became, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, absorbed. There were, there were earthquakes in the caves. So a lot, of, a lot of the cultures and stuff were destroyed, but we still see, you know, that these people had to exit. So how did they exit? I'm going to tell you how they exit. The Caucasians remained in the caves until the Santorini volcano. The theory of, the theory of volcano eruption was a catastrophe. Catastrophe. The volcano eruption devastated the Aegean island of Thera, which was also called Santorini, circa 1600 BC, 1600 years for the present. There's a very good article about some of the consequences of this volcano. It's uh, by P. Lamoureux. It's called, it was written in 1995. It's called Worldwide Environmental Impacts from the Eruption of Thera. And uh, this is, uh, you know, I took this, uh, this uh, from his uh, abstract. But let me explain, let me tell you what happened. According to, uh, to Lamarou, he says that, and I quote, the, er the eruptions of Thera Santorini between 1628 and 1450 BC constitute a natural catastrophe unparalleled in all of history. The last major eruption in 1450 BC destroyed the entire Minoan fleet at Crete at a time when the Minoans dominated the Mediterranean world. In addition, there had to be massive loss of life from ejecta, gases, volcanic ash, bombs and flows, the collapse of a majestic mountain into a, a caldera, 15 kilometers in diameter, caused a giant ocean wave, a tsunami, that, that at its source was estimated in excess of 46 meters high. The tsunami destroyed ships as far away as Crete, 105 kilometers, and killed thousands of people along the shoreline in the eastern Mediterranean area. At distant points in Asia Minor and Africa, there was darkness from ash fallout, lightning, and destructive earthquakes. Earthquakes, waves emanating from the epicenter near the ancient volcano, were felt as far away as the Norwegian countries. These disturbances caused great physical damage in the eastern Mediterranean and along the Rift Valley system from Turkey to the, to the south and central Africa. Yes, yes. What happened in a sense is that these, the Santorini volcano was so powerful that it opened up the caves. It opened up the caves in Central Asia. And as these caves became open, Caucasians poured out. That's where the Caucasians came from. What was the question at the beginning? Where did the white man come from? The white man came from the caves and they exited these caves after the Santorini volcano. And see what made the Santorini volcano so good is that when, when the Caucasians exited the caves 
as you can see, many of the ancient civilizations, they had been, they were really, uh, they they were really, you know, down. They really didn't have the power. They were weak. Many of many of the various peoples who lived in these civilizations, they were killed off as a result of the of the of the volcano and other eruptions. So many of the people were killed off. So then the Caucasians had an easy path moving out of Central Asia into Europe, and that they could easily conquer many of these black civilizations, easily conquer many of these black people because of the fact they had been weakened by this volcano that caused all this damage. Yes, that's where the Caucasian came from. He came from the caves, and he expanded from the caves in Central Asia all across Europe. There's dis disagreement over where the Caucasians spread across Europe from. Didem Kambudas maintains that Europeans had their origin in the Pontic Steppe country on the north coast of the Black Sea and began to expand into Europe as Kurgan nomads after 4000 BC. This is far too early. In 1987, Dr. C. Renfrew hypothesized that the Indo-Europeans lived in eastern Anatolia and spread into Europe around 7,000 years ago with the spread of agriculture. This is also false. They were in the caves at that time. Both these views have little support based upon the ancestral cultural terms used by the Proto-Indo-European Caucasians, which are predominantly of non-Indo-European origin. In other words, in a sense is that when you look at the culture, and they talk about, in a sense, a, a cattle culture, farming culture. Just about all those words, they don't go back. They're not Proto-Indo-European. They mainly came from, uh, from the uh, Black people who lived in Europe, and they got these terms after they conquered these Black people. After a comparison of linguistic, agricultural, and genetic evidence, researchers found little support for both of these theories. No, the theory of, of Gimbutas and Aguirre and the theory of uh, Renfrew, they have no, uh, they have really no, 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 no support. The genetic evidence supporting the absence of an Indo-European origin in the Anatolian region, but they were in the Anatolian region because that's where the caves opened up in Anatolia and also in, in, in other parts of Turkey. That's where the caves opened up and all these Caucasians just came out of the caves. You see. The, the north and east of Anatolia was inhabited by non-Indo-European speakers. It appears that Indo-Europeans did not enter Anatolia until sometime between 2800 BC. At this time, we note the appearance of Indo European Hittite names in the literary records of the old kingdom of Hatti. And at least as late as 1900 BC, Anatolia was basically still Hattian. Caucasians appear in Europe after 1400 BC. I repeat, Caucasians appear in Europe after 1400 BC because that was after what? The Santorini volcano, when they began to attack black civilizations in Central Asia and Europe. They were known in history as the people of the sea or Indo-Europeans. Over there on the uh, side, you can see some of these people of the sea as they began, in a sense, to uh, to invade uh, to invade uh, Egypt. The usual method of Indo-European and also Chinese invasion was twofold. First, set, first they settle in your country in small groups, and they're you know almost partly assimilated. Over a period of time, their numbers increase. Once Caucasians or, or Asian people, once they reach a numerical majority, they join forces with other Indo-European speaking groups to militarily overthrow the original inhabitants in a specific area and take political power. In other words, we would let them in. They'd be begging, give us some place to stay. We'll feed them, clothe them, give them homes. And then, then once they became a, major, a, a majority, they would just kill us off. Since these communities occupied by the Blacks often saw themselves as residents of a city-state, they would ignore the defeat of their neighbors. Yes, yeah, see, we, because of the fact that we were so tribalistic, that has always allowed Europeans to take us over. You see, instead of, in a sense, joining into a confederacy and we all fight together, you know, except for Egypt, most of the time the states wanted to be independent. And this independence allowed the white man to take over allowed Caucasians to take over these ancient black civilizations. It also allowed, in a sense, Caucasians to take over Africa because Africans were fighting among themselves. It also allowed the Caucasians to take over America. Why? Because black aboriginal tribes were fighting each other over this nationalism ish. This typified the second form of invasion of the country formerly ruled by the Proto-Saharan Kushites or blacks. Blacks have failed even today to recognize that even though whites are highly nationalistic, and engaged in numerous fratricidal wars, 
They will unify temporarily to defeat non-European people. As a result, in cases where the Blacks have been politically organized into states or empires, rather than isolated city states, the large, but large political units have lasted for hundreds of years, as typified by ancient Egypt, Axum, Male, and ancient Ghana. Diana Konoff, on the other hand, believes that the Indo-European homeland was in the Balkan Carpathian region. He has shown that the culture terms of the IE group indicate that they made their way across forest steeps and deciduous forest zones to settle other parts of the world. This view is highly probable. The view that these people were farmers seem unlikely, since the ideal farming areas in Europe were already settled by the Anu and people from the fertile African Crescent. Instead of being farmers, the IE people were originally nomads. The steppes often the steppes could not have been the homeland of the Caucasians because it was heavily occupied by the Proto-Saharan people until after 1300 BC. In support of an early presence of Indo-European Caucasian speakers on the steppes, many scholars maintain that the Adranov culture and wheeled vehicles are marks of Indo-European high culture. That's false too. They got that from us. This view is first supported by the fact that the eye roots for wheel number four. Use of a number to, use of a, of a number to signify the wheel you know, illustrates that this technological innovation must have come from elsewhere. There's no way they could have four turns for wheel, right? They should only have one if they developed it. They didn't develop. They got the idea about the wheel from Black people and was later adopted by the Proto-Indo-European after these dispersals. You know, this map can kind of, uh, down the bottom, this map can kind of show you how they spread from out of Venice, from Central, uh, Central Asia into our Europe. The horse cannot be a market for the Caucasoid and no European dispersal either. It would appear that in the steppes, the horse was not intensely used until the Iron Age. B.M. Mason believes that horse domestication and riding developed in the first millennium BC on the steppes. Again, in a sense, first millennium BC, that would be uh, 1000 BC, and that would again correlate with what? The expansion of the people of the sea. The only white people, i.e., or Indo Europeans, were Kurgan nomadic warriors. Kurgan is a name used by archaeologists for the early Caucasians. The term IE does not refer to a racial group because many of the ancient IE speakers may have been black. Given the fact that among the depictions of the people of the sea on Egyptian monuments, there are African people. See, because we see the, the people of the sea were kind of a mixed group, Caucasians and blacks. But today, the only IE people we have are Caucasians. Evolving in the Caucasus Mountains, the Caucasians exited the caves and Kurgan folk were pastoralists. They herded cattle, pigs, and sheep. The first Caucasians or Kurgans, Kurgan people were the people of the sea. They began to infiltrate the Aegean after 1200 BC. These people usually wore horn helmets and used round shields. The blacks used long body shields. You can see a picture on the uh, left-hand side of uh, some of the uh, people of the sea. You can see the horned helmet, you see. But again, um, you know, the Egyptians were able to defeat the early Caucasians. Pictures of these nomadic warriors are depicted in courtyards of Medinet Habu in Egypt. These white, these white Japhetic Philistine folk were relocated in Palestine, where 200 years later they destroyed Sidon and Troy. This Philistine Kurgan ethnic group is called Fars in Egyptian documents. Another group of Kurgan tribes took Crete from bases in Crete. They invaded North Africa, west of Egypt. These Kurgan tribesmen were called Rebu by the Egyptians. This group formed the white Libyan population, which occupied much of the Delta region of Egypt before the founding of Carthage by the Phoenicians. It was also, it was also in, in, in uh, Palestine or Israel, where we see in a sense that these, these early Caucasians, they, they mixed with the white Arabs, the white Arabs who were mainly from Syria. And that's why in a sense we see that, that many, many of the Palestinians, if you notice, they they, you couldn't tell the difference between a uh, Palestinian and, and the average uh, white European because of the fact that many of these early Caucasians mixed with, in a sense, the white, the white, in a sense, Arabs. Yes, the white Arabs and the Caucasians are not, they did not come from the same origins. As I said before, the Caucasians, they came out of the caves. The white Arabs, they evolved in some other way. Now we know where the white man came from. It was the caves. The Caucasians went into the caves black and they came out white. 
They spread into Europe from Central Asia out to 1400 BC because of the volcano at Santorino. Yes, yes, yes. The white man came from the caves under Europe. Again, I want you to go to Patreon. That's where I'm going to put the slides. You can find me at Twitter at Dr. Clyde Winners 8. Follow me at TikTok.com at Clyde Winners 3 to view my shorts. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, on this platform, here on uh, on uh, on uh, my Black History platform, I have almost 300, uh, 300 videos on, uh, on various aspects of Black History. I got shorts. I got these lives. Check it out. Support my site. Right now, please, take a minute and subscribe. Subscribe to this site. That way you'll know when I'm doing more, doing uh, new videos. And uh, you can join me when I'm doing these videos so you can catch these lives. Because I know a lot of times when we do the lives, it allows it allows uh, people, in a sense, if I have the time, to ask questions and get even, get even more understanding of uh, what uh, what the uh, subject was all about. And uh, you can uh, order my books at Amazon.com. Uh, some of my books on ancient, on ancient America include Atlantis in Mexico, African Empires in Ancient America. We are not just Africans. Then we also have ancient scripts in South America. You can get my book, The Mandian Ancient America and the Black Mound Builders of America. These books will give you all the information that you need to know about the black aboriginals who ruled the American continent. If you want to find out more about how the white, how the white race originated, find detailed sources, get some footnotes, get some further, further articles and books that you can read, get my books, Origin of Black Neanderthals and the White Race, and get my books, Black in Europe, Prehistory to Contemporary Times, you can order all of my books at Amazon.com. Yes, you can order my books at Amazon.com. Go there and get the books. Uh, we're going to be uh, teaching a class, me and Sister Janice. Uh, and so I want you to check out this advertisement about the class that we're going to be begin teaching on January 22nd. and Sister Shanice on an epic journey through hidden chapters of important Black African history in Britain. Brace yourself for an epic journey into uncharted territories with this up-and-coming groundbreaking online study course. Who is it for? If you are an African history enthusiast, if you are looking for Black history material as an educationalist, if you are a parent homeschooling your children, about black British history and want to broaden their curriculum with the knowledge that they're not going to acquire in the mainstream, then this course is for you. Black people in Britain have a greater belonging to Britain and the British Isles than you could imagine. Seize your spot on this pioneering course and be part of resurrecting our true history, starting 22nd of January from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. £199 and installment payment options are available. For more information, visit sistershanice.gumroad.com. Sister, S I S T A, shanice.gumroad.com. Okay, uh, that class is 7 30 p.m. That's going to be that's British time, so that'll be about tw 12. 30 p.m. American time, you know, so so if you join the class and you're in America, we're going to be doing the class at 1230 in the afternoon. That's 730. That is uh, that is uh, that is, uh, you know, UK time this this Sunday, this Sunday, me and Yoshi Ma, we're going to be doing another presentation of then and now. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this thumbnail made by the genius. I know you're saying, what is the connection between the gangbangers on the left and the aboriginals on the right? You see, Yoshi Mod and I, we're going to talk about gangs in Chicago and gangs in Houston, then and now. Join us Saturday night. 
I mean, Sunday night. Join us Sunday night on Then and Now. We're going to begin at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You better check this out if you want to know why Yoshimod made this super duper thumbnail for our Then and Now broadcast this Sunday, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. B1, B1, we got to be black first. You can't, you can't, all this stuff about nationality, I'm an Aboriginal, I'm Choctaw Cree, I'm Catholic, I'm, 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 I'm Baptist. That's all this nationality ish. That's how the white man took over. You got to be B1, black first, you see? Also, I want you to make sure in the sense that if you like some of the, uh, if you like that thumbnail, if you like some of the, uh, the, uh, my, my introduction, you got to check out Yoshimod so he can make your website beautiful. At Yoshimod Productions, we're here to take your brand and creativity to new heights. From EPKs to AI commercials, animated music commercials to animated AI bios, book covers to picture flyers, and so much more, we've got you covered. Our team is dedicated to delivering high quality, cutting edge designs that leave a lasting impression. And for our valued clients, we offer exceptional creativity, a customer-centric approach, and work that reflects the latest trends and technologies. Just about making art, we're about creating experiences. Your brand, your vision, our artistry. Professionalism and reliability are the cornerstones of everything we do. We're more than a service, we're your creative partners. If you're ready to make your brand shine, look no further than Yoshimod Productions. Join us in the journey of creativity. Contact us today and let's make your vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, as I said earlier, I hope now you understand where the European came from. You know, uh, there's a Lux Botanica. Uh, we have, in a sense, Gabriel on the on the Boodle. You know, Mike David. You know, Mike. Uh, this is very uh, this is very interesting. You know, Mike David. He tells us what he, Mike David tells us that. Black people are some great people. They just got they just got to get back to the basics, family, and to lineage. Yes, 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 yes. Gaspar uh, Yanga, sure, great, great lecture. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know. Okay, Alcazo, uh, Andrew O. Um, you know, that's right. They were cavemen, cavemen. Yes, they were cavemen. You know, uh, you know, I have a few minutes. If you guys uh, have any questions about this video or any other questions dealing with black history, put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them now if you're interested. Yeah, black, uh, you're, you're right, we'll be catching the replay. Yeah, it's good to always check out the replay, Black Lyran, because, uh, Lyran, because see, the thing is this is that, what you find is, is that sometimes when you look at videos twice, you can, you can see something that you may have missed. Okay, uh, JP says, uh, could you do a lecture on how Dravidian Indians got to the West Indies? Well, uh, I could probably do a video, but that's uh, really easy because Remember, it was the British. The British, they, they uh, brought the Dravidians to the uh, West Indies, and they brought the, Brit the, uh, the British brought them to the West Indies so they could replace the, uh, the Blacks. They wanted to make them middlemen. You have to understand that the European, in a sense, he always liked to have uh, what, what he calls middle groups, and he used these middle groups to kind of have them 
compete with the uh, with with the black population. You know, I uh, I don't know about ancient. Uh, I don't remember any ancient Dravidians. They, no ancient Dravidians came. The Dravidians who live in the in the Caribbean today, they were brought there by the uh, by the British. Ah, great. I'm glad to hear this. You know, this is uh, from uh, Mike David. Uh, Mike David, I'm, I'm glad I, you're going to enjoy the books. And what Mike David says, I got your history of the black race two days ago, and I got your other book. Should be in my mailbox today. Yes, yes, yes. Get the books. My history of the black race is a very good book because it tells you the history of where every black person, where every black civilization existed on the planet Earth. Okay, uh, here's another thought. Uh, Gabriel, Gabriel, uh, he's he's uh, saying I thought of the out of India proto Indo European theory. No, the uh, uh, no, no, uh, the pro the uh, the Caucasians did not come out of India. That's just a lie. Those uh, those people who who, uh, who say that they're proto European, those are mainly what they call not proto European. They call them uh, proto. Uh, the uh, the speakers who live there today, the kind of black people who live there today, and the light skinned people, they're not they're not related they're not related in a sense to the Indo Europeans. The reason that they claim that 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 the present population in India is in a sense is Indo European is because of the fact in a sense that they found relationship between many uh, many Indian languages, Hindi and other languages, to ancient Greek. But the reason that there's a relationship, a relationship between ancient Greek and some of the uh, Aryan languages, is because of the fact, in a sense, that uh, the Persians, the Persians or the blacks, the Lamites who you who ruled Persia, they settled they settled some uh, Greeks in, in in a sense, in Afghanistan and uh, and northern India back in the day because they were troublemakers. So that's why there's a relationship between Greek, the Greek language, and the uh, ancient uh, and uh, Hindi and other uh, Indian languages. But the Indo-Europeans didn't come from India. See, uh, we know that the uh, we know that that the Indo-Aryan speakers, Indo-Aryan speakers now, Indo-Aryan means that that there's a connection between the people who live in Iran and the and the people who live in India. The languages are sim are similar. The so-called Indo-Aryan people, the Indo-Aryan people, we have evidence that they came into India. They came into India from outside India on two waves. They uh, used what's called the gray wear. And they first entered India about 1000 BC. And you know, and uh, many of these, uh, many of these people in a sense are called Aryan based upon the fact that Aryan was the name for the upper class people who lived in the uh, country. But uh, but the Indo Europeans did not come from India. Indo Europeans, when you say Indo Europeans, that means you're talking about talking about Caucasians, see. And these Caucasians, as I've already explained to you, they came from Central Asia, and they came from Central Asia after the volcanic eruption at San Dorino that opened up the entrances and to the caves and allowed them to exit. Uh, okay, um, future being saying the name Muslim should be buried right next to the word Negro or the N-word. I, I don't know about that. A Muslim, uh, Muslim, is, Muslim just means a believer in Islam, a follower of Islam. So I don't know. I don't know why you say that. You know, maybe you should explain future being. I don't understand that. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, Dor, Dor or L, uh, they say that a uh, question, 
The movie The Great Wall, Matt Damon, features the monsters coming from caves during the Santorini explosion. Uh, those, those monsters would have been, as I tell you, the Europeans. And, and as I, I showed you those pictures from uh, the Grotto, Grotto de, de Marche, and I showed you how they look. So maybe uh, they would have been considered uh, they would have been considered monsters because they look so different. They look so different from normal human beings. And that's one of the reasons why they spend their time today trying to mate with melanated people so they don't have to uh, they don't have to uh, to have that difference and stuff. Okay, how's how are you doing, uh, Dorvell? Uh, Mike David, also TNS. What up, dude? And then also, I'd like to welcome also Lux Botanica. Very good, very good. How do they breathe? Um, Lux Botanica asks this question: How do they breathe? It would have been air in the cage, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, just because uh, just because uh, the main the main entrances may have been closed, it would have been other. Other, uh, you know, other uh, fish, fixture, fissures in the earth, they would have allowed air to come into the cave. So that's how they would have breathed. So they, it would have been, uh, they would have had the possibility of breathing. Just because um, the exits were closed, that wouldn't have caused them to suffocate, you know, because there would have been other areas that would have brought the brought the air in. But I think the most interesting thing about this whole idea of living in the caves is that they were able to, to build caves. They were able to build caves that stretched all the way from Scotland. Remember, if the caves go all the way to Scotland, that means they had to go under the British Channel. You see, and the reason they could go, they had to go under the British Channel, and then, in a sense, reach the uh, the, con the uh, continent. But uh, there was a landmass. There was a landmass that connected that connected Britain. I can't think of the name of the landmass now, but there was a landmass that connected Britain to the mainland. And uh, but it was a tsunami, I think, around. 6,000 between 6,000 and 4,000 BC that they believe that it was submerged. Okay, uh, Cordo, Cordo and Nesset, Billy, how many FBA were here when the cave uh, beasts arrived? Um, uh, there, uh, we don't know. They estimate that uh, when, when Europeans first came to the Americas, there may have been millions of uh, Indians in North and South America. But what happened is that, uh, remember that many of the Indians that lived in North and South America uh, after 1492, many of them were killed off as a result of diseases. Okay, our grandparents are Dravidians from Guyana. Okay, yeah, uh, Jesslyn, yeah, but they would have uh, they would have came with the British. But uh, you know, I've written I've written a lot of I've written what I've written three books on the origin of, of the Dravidians, and um, there was there were there were some Dravidian slaves, there were some Dravidian slaves deposited in in the uh, in the Caribbean and a few in. Uh, and a few in North America, but it wasn't that many. It wasn't that many. I wrote an article on that years ago, but uh, the vast majority, you know, would have came with the uh, British. Okay, uh, Yoshima, could uh, could he see any continuity within the uh, Timu? Timu Chuan and the Manika language people. Well, there was a lot of Mandingo tribes over here. Uh, but the, uh, when you look at uh, Timu Can, Timu, 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 Timu Can, um, that could be true. But see, there was already in North Carolina, North Carolina and Virginia, they are, they had the Mandinka tribe, they had the Mandin. It was already Mandingo people. But I think that the many other Mandinka people who lived in North Carolina. And Virginia, I think uh, they they uh, they began in a sense. I think many of them came uh, with Abu Bakari. There may have been there were Mandingo people who were the Olmecs, but I think most of the uh, Mandingo people in North America, many of them may have came with uh, with with uh, 
man's Abu Bakari who, who traveled to the uh, Americas in 1310. You know, the reason I say that is that many of the artifacts that they found in the mounds, these artifacts correspond or show continuity with artifacts that they found along the uh, the, ne the Niger River, you know. But uh, I haven't never I haven't never studied uh, Temu Temuquen, so I can't really say if the uh, languages are related. Okay, uh, here uh, Karen Vincent is talking about the triangle slave trade. There were two triangle slave trades. The first, the first, the first triangle slave trade was the, was the slave was the trade in chattel slaves between the United States and the Caribbean. They would leave in a sense. They would take rum. They would take rum from the United States, and they would take this rum up to uh, up to our up to uh, Britain. And they would sell the rum and they would buy Irish slaves and they would bring those Irish slaves back down to the uh, to the Caribbean. And uh, then they would, uh, in a sense, uh, sell the Irish slaves there, sell some of the Irish slaves there and then take the rest of the Irish slaves over to, you know, cities and, uh, you know, like towns in North Carolina, South, you know, North Carolina, Charleston and Virginia. The second, the second triangle trade was a trade that began around 1637. And this was a trade between the United States and the Caribbean. And what they would do is that they would, they would attack Aboriginal villages in North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, et cetera. Once they, uh, once they uh, would attack the villages, they would take these Black Indians and they would take these Black Indians from North Carolina, Virginia, they would take them over to the Caribbean and sell them, sell them as chattel slaves in Jamaica, Bermuda, and then they would come back from the Caribbean and they would carry in a sense sugar. They would take, they would carry sugar and other products, and they would take the sugar from the Caribbean and bring it to uh, to the Americas. And then they would use that sugar to make rum. Then they would go through the process again of of attacking Indian villages, making them chattel slaves, and they would take the rum and the chattel aboriginal slaves to the caribbean and then the final slave the final uh triangle triangle slave trade was the slave trade that began around 1670 uh in our in earnestly we could say at least for north america it began around 1700 and that was when you would you would move from america from the, from the united states ports all up and down the east coast you go you would leave from up and down from the coast, the eastern eastern coast of America, go to Africa, get buy some slaves, and then bring those slaves back to the Caribbean or North America. That was the uh, final. So it was three slave trade, three triangular slave trade. The first triangular slave trade was between Americas, Ireland, the UK, Caribbean, back to America. The second, the second triangular trade was from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, take the uh, aboriginals, sell them as slaves in the Caribbean, then come back to the United States. And then the final triangular trade was between the Amer America, uh, Africa, then back to the Caribbean and the uh, United States. So it was three triangular trades, not just one. Uh, JP said, I just got finished with your nationality law of FBA book, and it was amazing. Uh, thank you. I I'm glad you enjoyed the book. I wrote that book, and I'm going to talk about that book further because many black, many black people, many aboriginals, many of our aboriginals today, you know, because of the fact that Dane Calloway and Carimio, I think Dane Calloway and I think Carimio, I think they sincerely want to really help aboriginal blacks fba know their history but they want you to go back to being your going back to your tribe you know cree Seminole, and all that type of stuff they don't understand is that it's because of the fact that we were so nationalistic because of the fact that we belong to so many tribes that the white man was able in a sense caucasians were able to take over this country because see when you start going into into tribalism it makes you feel that your tribe is better than the other tribe 
and and as a result after a while it's divide and rule and so so even though Carimio and Dale Calloway think they're doing the right thing they're really working for the European and that's why the European makes it look as though they have a hundred thousand subscribers they only make it look like they have a hundred thousand subscribers because of the fact in a sense that they want them to divide black people they don't want you to be one because if you're being one that means that you're recognized in a sense that nationality shouldn't matter you see but uh thanks again jp i'm glad you enjoyed the book Okay, uh, Mike David, uh, he says, I want to get some information about the lost city of Atlantis. I'm hearing the uh, the Gal people and Carth Carthaginians and Phoenicians came from there. Um, Atlantis Atlantis is a deep is a deep uh, is a deep subject, but uh, you know uh, we know we know in a sense that uh, the Phoenicians the uh, the so called uh, Gail people, most of them, they, they, they all came, they were, uh, they mainly came from uh, Egypt and stuff. But there were, there were some, uh, there were in a sense, what I call Neo-Atlanteans. And the Neo-Atlanteans, after, after, uh, after Atlantis uh, sunk, many uh, Neo-Atlanteans or New Atlanteans, they migrated from the, from the island of Atlantis to the Nile Valley. And from the Nile Valley, they expanded to other parts of the world. The uh, main center of the of the of the Neo Atlanteans was in, in what we call the country today, mar the modern country today. We call Libya. That's where mar many Neo Atlanteans uh, came from. You know, if you want to find out a little bit more about the Neo Atlanteans and their expand and their uh, their expansion, you may want to get my book. Uh, you know, Atlantis and Mexico. And in Atlantis and Mexico, when I discuss the, the, uh, the, the migration of the Olmec people from Africa to the Americas. If you get that book, it'll tell you a little bit about Atlantis as it existed in, uh, in Africa. But again, Atlantis is interesting, but uh, it's, uh, it's, a lot of it is interesting when you think about it, but a lot of it is in, in, in terms of looking at not the Atlantis civilization, because that's under the water. So what we look at is we try to look at those civilizations they may adopt it. Many of the uh, many of the uh, civilizational elements that made up ancient Atlantis. Okay. Okay. Uh, Future Bean says that the name Muslim should be buried right alongside. With the N word, and so let's start calling uh, those two names uh, M and M and N. I mean, if that's what uh, you guys would want to do, fine. I, I, I really say that uh, you know, I, I really feel that uh, I think that what we, sh we should call ourselves is B one black first. We should try to be black first and not allow any nationality to to uh, dominate us or dictate to us who and what we are. Ah, this is a good point. Uh, you're you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. You know, and then said Billy, is that mating mating with black folks will keep them from dying off. That's right. Not only uh, Biddy. I'm sorry, that was a uh, Cordzo, Hotar, Nasset, Biddy, and uh, yes, because see, they want to mate with black people because they need that melanin. And if you notice, they're always trying to uh, get our women to mate with them. Right now, many uh, many foundational Black American women will not mate with them, and that's one of the reasons why, for a long period of time, they were seeking the Asians. But now they're able to get many of the immigrant, many of the immigrant, uh, the daughters of immigrants. They they kind of gravitate towards marrying, you know, uh, Caucasians because of the fact that in their homeland they believe that they're uh, that they're in a sense, uh, you know, uh, gods or whites, so they like them. Okay. Here's another interesting statement. Gabriel says, so black people lived, lived above cave people in Scotland for thousands of years without knowing that. Yeah, they did. They didn't know they were, they didn't know they were under the ground. I mean, why would why would they want to go in a cave? They were farming, 
They had cattle. They had goats. Why would they want to go into the caves? You see. You know, by that by that time, that was during the Neolithic. By the time uh, by the time these new black people came there, you know, the Picts, the uh, the, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Anu, and all that. They would they would have up they would have forgotten about the black people who went into the caves. So they would so they wouldn't have had any reason to really go and try to uh to go into the caves and find these people. Why couldn't why couldn't they live in the caves? You know, I mean, hey, throughout history, throughout history, we find we find that what the Egyptians said they came from the mountains of the moon. The uh Chinese said they came from the Tia Shan Mountains. So it's not it's nothing new in terms of of various groups or races of people that live high up in the mountains in some type of area. And then after a catastrophe, they come down. I mean, it might be, it might be a race of people now that we don't even know about that's living in some mountainous area. And then, uh, and then if there's some sort of a, uh, you know, catastrophe, they may come down to the, uh, come down from the mountains and take over. Yes. It was easy for people to live in the ground and not know that there was a, uh, another race of people living there. Okay, which is older, the Nile Valley or the Indus Valley civilization? Okay, the Nile Valley and Indus Valley civilization, they all they were about um they, they weren't older because they all came from the uh they all they all were Kushites. See what happened is this is that the Anu people, the Anu people, they they built the civilization of ancient Egypt, as you know. But see what happened is is that that after uh, after the uh, the last flood around uh some people say around 4,000 BC when they had the last flood. At the 4,000 BC, many of the Anu centers around the world were destroyed. And what happened is, is that is that black people from Middle Africa, I call them the ancient civilization of Ma. Go and look at my video on the Ma, my videos on the Ma civilization. And the Ma, the people of the Ma civilization, they were the Kushites, and they founded the civilizations of Egypt and the civilization of the Indus Valley. These are uh, in the Sumerian in the Sumerian literature. We find that that ain't that we find in a sense that Sumer called the Indus Valley. They call the Indus what do they call the Indus Valley. They call the Indus Valley Del Moon. Magan was Magan was the name of ancient uh, ancient uh, Egypt. And uh, I think what was it Meluha? I think Meluha was the name of uh, of the civilization in the. Uh, uh, you know the Exumite civilization in ancient Ethiopia, but no, uh, the uh, the uh, Indus Valley civilization. It's uh, it's a it's it's a little younger than the Egyptian civilization, cause the uh, you know. But again, they're both old, but they were related civilizations, and they were founded by the same people. Uh, Adam uh, Adam Byers, you say, did uh, Denov Den Denisovian DNA is it African? I think Denisovian. This is just my own opinion. They just that's a made up ish. I don't even think I don't even think that group of people really existed. That's just a make believe people. See the European sometimes they go through this hypothesis and they they uh they try to describe DNA and and they'll say various groups lived and they didn't live. I don't know if. The Denisovians really ever existed. Okay, uh, Mike said, I've heard that the 20 somewhat slaves in 1619 didn't come from Africa. It was intercepted by pirates. Yeah, they 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 came from Africa, but they were intercepted by pirates. But you gotta remember that. The people who came in 1619, they were not slaves. These people were chat. These people were, remember, they made them in a sense, you know, they they uh, they they were uh, indentured servants. The first the first chattel slaves in America were black Irish. The second chattel slaves were Aboriginals. They didn't make they didn't make Africans chattel slaves until 1670. Before 1670, all Africans that lived in the Americas, they were not chattel slaves. 
they were indentured servants. So in, in uh, 1619, they, those people were slaves. Um, ghost, ghost, you say that the, uh, the Australoid people have the most Denisovian DNA of the Africans, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. It's all bullshit, man. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. They made, they made those people up. They said they found this little skeleton and the DNA is this and that. Read the literature carefully. And if you read the literature carefully, you'll know that's just a made up group. Of, that's a made up group of people. I don't I don't think they ever really existed, you know. <laughs> this is a good one. My mom's side is from North Carolina and my dad is from the Caribbean. Maybe that is why she liked it. You, you might be right because he uh you know uh, sister Shanice uh when she was uh trying to donate blood she was trying to donate blood uh, to uh, to uh, over when she when she was in London. She grew up in London, and when she was do do trying to donate blood, she found that a perfect match, a perfect match of her blood type, was uh, found in uh, in uh, in the United States. And she didn't understand that, but we can understand that now because see, many of the uh, many of the Black Irish people who were made slaves in North America. There was also black Irish slaves in the Caribbean. And so, and so then because of the fact that, that, that your mom and dad ancestors may have been black Irish, maybe that is why they liked each other. But there is a relationship. You know, many of the Caribbean people are our cousins. They're our cousins two ways. Many, uh, many people that grew up in the Caribbean are our cousins because many Aboriginal black people were chattel slaves and many black Irish were chattel slaves in the Caribbean. The only difference between the Caribbeans and, and FBA is the fact in the sense is that FBA people know their history and FBA people are more of a warrior class. You see, in the Caribbean, because there was there were so few white people, they used black people to dominate and overlord the black people who lived in the Caribbean. So any so many, many uh, Caribbeans see other black people as their enemies. Whereas in the United States, as an FBA, we had white people who directly wanted to control us, white people who, def who directly wanted to beat us, and things like that. That's why that's why we we see we see a clear distinction between black and white people here because of the fact that we're prisoners of war. Let me explain to you. When they when they when Oliver Cromwell conquered the black Irish and made them chattel slaves, those chattel those black Irish that came here were what prisoners of war. When those white when those white when those English and Dutch and others, when they attacked Indian villages and they kidnapped those black Indians and made them chattel slaves on the tobacco plantations and, su and sugar plantations, then those black people in a sense were what? Those aboriginals were in a sense prisoners of war. When they went over there to Africa and those African tribes, you know, like the Dahomey, when they attacked in a sense other African tribes, and they had the, and they and they defeated those African tribes in battle. Those African tribes that came to the United States were what prisoners of war. So see, we recognize that we're prisoners of war. FBA are prisoners of war, and we keep this fighting spirit based upon the fact that that the white man, in a sense, he didn't allow black people to just beat each other's ass. He was always around to tell those black people to beat your ass. Okay, does uh, coily hair define us as, as a people? Nah, nah. We have different types of hair. You saw when I when I uh, gave that discussion of the original black people. You know, I mean, we have blue eyes, straight hair, <laughs> thin noses, thick lips, thin lips. No, no, no. We're 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 a, we're a very variable people because see, we make a mistake and we think that everybody's just one big nigger. No, no. Different black people evolved at different times. The first black, the first what they call anatomically modern Europeans, I mean Africans or, or, or modern people, these people in a sense were the Australians. That's why we see a little a little thick bridge across their forehead, but not as thick as maybe a Neanderthal man. And then in a sense, so they were the first the first 
um, anatomically modern humans. Then in a sense, we had we had the Khoisan. Then after the Khoisan, there was the Anu or the Pygmy people. Then after the Anu or the Pygmy people, there were the tall black people like us. We would be like the Kushites and stuff like that. So God, God in a sense, created different, different uh, black, black people at different times. We're not one big nigger. We're all from different things. And the reason that I can say that the that, that those four populations existed, the reason we know those four populations existed is based upon the skeletal remains that archaeologic that archaeologists have excavated and through these excavations and providing a timeline in terms of when these skeletons were excavated allows us to say that the original people were Australians. Then after the Australians came the Khoisan. Then after the Khoisan came the Anu or the Pygmy people. And then finally the tall people like us who are, would be more of the Kushite type. You know. So chemistry, uh, ma black magic, nah. We have all type of hair. It doesn't matter, you know. You know, back in back in the day, and I when I had hair, my hair was kind of kind of cool. But I mean, I had a deep afro, but now I'm balding. That's why I love Yoshi Ma because whenever Yoshi Ma makes pictures of me, he gives me hair again. Oh, thank you, Yoshi. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now this is a good point. Um, you know, Pink, uh, Pink, they made a very, uh, Pink, Pink Bergomon. Yeah. Why so many Black Americans and Caribbeans have Scotch Irish names? One reason that we have Scotch Irish names is let me explain to you. As I told you, they sent many Black Irish and Welch and Scotsmen to, uh, the Caribbean. Jamaica, uh, Morissette, I think it is, and, uh, Bermuda, all that. But also you had to understand, let me explain to you that, as I tell you, in, in 1625, I think it was King Charles, he sent 30,000 30, Black Irish over as chattel slaves to North America and, and the Caribbean. And then Oliver Cromwell, between, between 16, 1650 and 1659, I think he died in 1659, he sent over three or four hundred thousand black Irish, black Irish, to be chattel slaves in America and the Caribbean. So let me explain to you. Okay. That means that between 1630 and 1670, the majority of chattel slaves, the majority, the majority of chattel slaves on the plantations would have been black Irish and aboriginals. Okay, since many of the since many of the men, since many of the uh, the Aboriginal men were so so to uh, Bermuda, Jamaica, and places and, and places like that, that meant that the majority of chattel slaves on the plantations between 1630 and 1670 were Black Irish men, males, and Aboriginal women. So what happened is that these Aboriginal women. They married the black, the black, the black Irish males. Many of them would sometimes run away from the plantation, or they would get their, or they would get their freedom, and they would go back to the plantation. And then that's how that's how you got so many Scotch Irish names among black people. When you look at when you look at the uh, when you look at in a sense the Dow's rolls when they put when they put down the names of these uh, of these uh, so-called freemen. As belonging to the five civilized tribes, you see McCoy, McCoy, Crawford, Winters. The reason that they did that is that many of these Indians had many of these black Indians had Irish Scots names, you see. And then people say, Dr. Winters, you're talking bullshit. No, no, you had to understand. A lot of times we always gave, we we also always gave people children, uh, gave our children nicknames. Like I gave my children various nicknames, you know. And you know, might call him Red. You might call him John. You might call him Panther. You know, he acts real sneaky, so we'll call you in a sense Wolf, or whatever. So again, in a sense, that's why you see somebody that maybe be uh, be running running man or Red Man or stuff like that. But we got those those Scots Irish names because the fact is that that on the plantation, many of the slaves who had made it on the plantation were Black Irish and Aboriginal. And so then when they, when they started bringing African slaves onto the plantation, they would have made it there too. That's how we became foundational Black Americans. 
Foundational Black Americans are of a tripartite, a tripartite ethnogenesis. In other words, we're the product of three different groups. We're the products of the of the original Black Irish, Scots, Welch, chattel slaves on the plantation, and the aboriginal aboriginals who were who were sold into slavery by other Black people or captured in war with the white people, and Africans. So that means, in a sense, is that our ethnogenesis is the result of the mating of three different groups, like Irish, Aboriginal, and in a sense, you know, uh, African. That's what makes us unique. That's why we're the uh, foundation of Black Americans. So you gotta look at it. Why, why do you think that, why do you, why do you think that, that uh, FBA is so unique? Why, why do you think that we dominate? We dominate the culture. Why do you think that we're so great? We're so great because we're a product of three different groups. And we got all these different memories, all this creativity from our Irish, Black Irish, Scots, Welch, Aboriginal, and African ancestors. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, my uh, uh, my dad has a totally French name, and he's from Saint Lucia. That's because of the fact that the French ruled that island for a long time, and that's why you that's why you you would probably have that name. You see. But there's a there. It's it's kind of deep. It's kind of deep when you really get into it. The whole history of black people is not as clear as you think. Because see, what happened is that so many so many of our ancestors, so many of our ancestors, they refused in a sense to really discuss those those other ancestors. How you doing, Taz Taz uh, Fee and uh, Kikoba Fett? You know. Okay. My question, my paternal grandfather was born in 1910 and always told me that Indians looked like him and me. FBA born in Alabama. Why do modern Indians look non-FBA? Thank you. Well, the reason that, that modern Indians look non-FBA is because of this. You have to understand that uh, beginning with Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin said the best way to unite the state, the best way to take over the United States was for white, for Caucasians to mix with red Indians. You see the red Indians, the red Indians were not here when when the British and the Dutch first first landed in 1619 all that. It wasn't any red man here. The red Indians they came later. Many people don't understand is that the buffalo. There was buffalo in North Carolina, Virginia, Alabama. It was buffalo all over the place. Many red men migrated from the southwest and Mexico. They migrated from Mexico in the southwest all the way to North Carolina and South Carolina, we adopted them. And so then the white man allowed them to get our names. They took our heritage. See, the white, the Caucasians gave the red man our heritage and he said that you're just a nigger, you're a colored person. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote my book on uh, law and nationality because my book on law and nationality, I explained how we, how we in a sense move from being recognized as black people Recognized as copper-colored black tribal people to uh, to color to uh, colored people, and then after the Civil War, free men, and now in a sense we 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 decided that the best way to unify our people and to stop having all this fragmentation, Muslim, Muslim, Christian, Hebrew, Choctaw, Choctaw, was to call ourselves FBA, Foundational Black Americans, because that way we put everybody in the mix. Okay, you said uh, the mutation the mutation for straight hair is hard to study. It's not hard to study. That's because you got the genes, man. You got the genes inside of you. That's just white man bullshit. That's bullshit. The white man act like he don't know stuff when he don't want to admit that you already carry the genes for all those different types of hair. Look at how our babies are born. Remember, our, most of our babies are born with straight hair. Then, then over time, it might become a little bit more kinky or whatever. So that's all bullshit. If you wait for the white man to tell your history or your wife or the white man Caucasians to tell you uh, uh, your genetic foundations, you're going to be you're going to be lost forever. OK, um, 
Yeah, uh, Mike Dave to that, uh, Mr. Clyde, Dr. Clyde Winters. You got so many books, I can't keep up laughing a lot. You're absolutely correct. I really, I really wish I didn't have to write all these books. But I write a lot of these books because for for about 20 years, many of our many of our black uh, scholars and leaders, they all only they only want to talk about Egypt. We have more history than Egypt, and that's why I write it. But I've been really lucky. I've been really lucky. I've been having my uh, research class. And now we got a new we got a new set of people who are writing books. We got our sister Shanice. She's written a very interesting book on the uh, on 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 King Afa, and she talks about the prehistory of uh, the prehistory of, uh, of of people in Europe. Then we got uh, B Man. B Man's written a, a really beautiful book on our on our on our on our spiritualism. Then we got uh, we got a uh, Baquet. You know, she's written a, a super book on. On the mother's womb, and, and I even had to use that book because that book helps you to uh, helps you to be able, in a sense, to recover some of your some of your uh, some of your pride and recover. You know, move away from maybe being angry at your mom because she gives you exercise. You got to get the book. You know, you got to get a book. Get her book, the cat. You know, and uh, the mother's womb, and uh, these things, in a sense, are all important. You know. Uh, you're right. It's uh, you say uh, you know, it's more obscure to me than the pigment uh, mutate pigment mutation. Not really. It's just that. See, it's it's not it's not a right now. The vast majority of a, of a, of of population geneticists, they're mainly <coughs> they're mainly in a sense white. They're mainly at Harvard. You got about two or three uh, black geneticists. But the people who are doing the uh, who are who are doing the essay essay in it and analyzing this DNA, they're not really interested in in, in the hair where the hair hair follicles and all that develop. They're not really interested in that. And why do you think they're going to tell you something like that? If they tell you if they tell you your true genetic your true genetic profile, then you would feel in a sense, hey, damn, why are these white people carrying our genes? Yes. See, the whole foundation of, 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 of population genetics is based upon a lie. Population genetics claims that black and white people and Asian people were separated for 40,000 years. And because they were separated for 40,000 years, we can say that Asians had a certain group of genes, Europeans had another group of genes, and Africans, they had another set of genes. And these genes, in a sense, are supposed to be continental, Asian, Europe, and African. But that's all bullshit because we know that that we weren't separated for forty thousand years. The Moors they the, the Moors they ruled Europe, and the Moors came from Senegal. Yes, Senegal and the Senegambia in West Africa. They came from Senegal and they ruled Europe from seven eleven to fourteen ninety two. So so any of their any of their uh, any of their discussion about genetics and all that type of stuff is uh, false because it's based upon it's based upon a false premise. Correct. This is a very correct. You know, Darlene, you're you're correct. We are finding out that those whites actually took our names. Blacks were taken from Scotland, Ireland, and Britain, and brought to the islands in the United States. Yes, yes, they took our names. You know, it's very interesting that uh, when you see, you can look at these names because what happened is this is that the uh, the uh, British and other people they kept meticulous records, and when you look at these, you can you can see on the records the names. Of these black British uh, slaves that were brought over here, you know, sent over here by Oliver Cromwell. You can uh, find your name. You can go back in history. You know, uh, Doctor Short. Doctor Short. He's uh, uh, I know you've heard of Doctor Short. Doctor Short's been doing research, and he's been able, in a sense, to trace many of his uh, ancestors from North Carolina. You know, he's been able to trans many of his ancestors who originated in North Carolina and Virginia. He's been able to find. Some of his ancestors dating back to the 1100 A.D. See, they kept they kept very good records. You see, and that and that when you go back, that's why when you look at uh, remember, you know, Jay Rogers when he wrote books and he wrote about the fact that that many much of the the heraldry and some of the crests, 
the crest of the uh, of of the uh, of many people in Scotland and Ireland was a Moors, and he and he just said, oh, they just probably pretended no. Those were the actual people. See, those were the actual people. You know, that's why that's why a lot of times in the sense is that, you know, think about this, family. Think about this. Do you really think? Do you really think that black that the white man wanted you to have that name? Think of not. Come on now. Do you really think the white man wanted you to have your name? And the answer is no. So that's all made up ish. Okay, it's uh, we've been on for two hours. You know, I want to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, I hope that you guys will join us next week. Uh, join me next week, and we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to, in a sense, uh, talk more about ancient history. I hope you'll join me, same time, same place, three o'clock. Find me on my platform. Make sure that you make sure, in a sense, that you like the video. Right now, take your thumb up and press that like button. Subscribe. I want you to subscribe because that way, in a sense, you'll get the notifications. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.